Hey folks, how are you doing? I'm Dan Zastro, General Manager here at the Smith Profile Film Center. Welcome to 2020's first installment of Science on Screen. We're so pleased to bring this back. You can applaud that, absolutely. This is such a fun series that we do. And so we're changing it up a little bit this time around. Uh, I have a very dear friend of mine, David Templeton, who is uh, an incredible uh, Bay Area journalist. And so I know some of you know him because he has this great long-term column he's been doing called Talking Pictures. How many of you know about Talking Pictures? Yes. Excellent. His, he, he would take interesting guests to movies in the quest for the ultimate post-film conversation. Well, why not just have him here and show the movies and have those great post-film conversations up on the stage instead of in his column? That was our thinking. So uh, David and I are putting together a wonderful series of films. We're going to try and do this once a month so that uh, we can really fit in all kinds of great content. Uh, David is doing some other wonderful things, too. He is a, a playwright uh, and an author. He has a short novel called Mary Shelley's Body, which was made into a play in, in 2017. He also has an upcoming robot-themed science fiction drama called Galatea. We have some flyers out there. It'll be uh, staged very shortly. Definitely grab one of these uh, March 20th through April 5th at Spreckles in Rona Park. All right. Please give David Templeton a hand. Come on up, David. Thank you. Good evening. This is fun. When Dan asked me to do this, I immediately started listing great movies in my mind and, and pairing them up with people that I think we could have some good conversations uh, about that film. Uh, the next one, uh, what's the date on that? Febru oh, February 13th, day before Valentine's Day. We're going to be showing the film Her with Joaquin Phoenix. And we are going to have a, a panel of young film critics who do a column called Millennials Talk Cinema. And uh, two of them are science fiction and fantasy novelists themselves. So they're going to be here. And uh, that will be very lively, I think. We're calling that one The Future of Sex, Love and Relationships in the Age of AI. So that should, should be a pretty good conversation. So the film tonight, I'm curious, how, how many people have never seen Contact before? All right. Of you who have seen it, how many have never seen it on a big screen? All right. Well, it's a very different experience. This film by Robert Zemeckis was uh, originally um, released in 1997. It was a movie that Robert Zemeckis made in between Forrest Gump and Cast Away, the two Tom Hanks movies. It's based on a book by Carl Sagan, though it was originally conceived by him and his wife, Androyan, as a film. In 1979, they created a 100-page treatment for the movie they wanted to make called Contact. And they started shopping it around, and eventually Warner Brothers got it. And for a while, they had Roland Joffe as the director, guy who'd done Killing Fields. And then for a while, George Miller of Mad Max had it. Uh, briefly, Robert Zemeckis looked at the script, but he had passed on it because he didn't like the ending. Uh, George Miller had some pretty crazy ideas. He wanted to rewrite it so that the Pope was a major side character in it. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to cast as uh, Palmer Joss, the, uh, the minister you'll see that Matthew McConaughey plays in this version. He wanted Rafe Fiennes to play that, which would have been fine. But his, his most interesting idea is he wanted the President of the United States to be played by Linda Hunt which would have been pretty great. So it kind of went into turnaround for a while, and then eventually uh, Carl Sagan turned his treatment into a novel that came out in 1985. And about 10 years later, Robert Zemeckis revisited it, had an idea of how to change the ending, and he became the director of the film. His idea originally for the president of the United States was actually Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman considered it, but he decided, oh, actually, I'm sorry, not Morgan Freeman. It was uh, Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier, Morgan Freeman was a pretty good president, though, in the, con the uh, what was it, the Deep Impact, the, the Comet movie. That's what I meant, the Comet. So the funny thing was that Sidney Poitier bowed out of this because he wanted to make the movie The Jackal that he was offered. Matthew McConaughey was cast in The Jackal, but he bowed out of that so he could make contact. <laughs> so a couple things I want you to uh, be looking out for. Um, 
There's a, a theme in here of SETI, of course, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, Jill Sarter is uh, the head of the Phoenix Project. She was one of the inspirations for the main character here that Jodie Foster plays. We invited her to come tonight, and she said she would be happy to, except tonight's her birthday, and she had plans. So happy birthday to Jill. Um, you're going to see some scenes that are set at a place called the Very Large Array in Socorro, New Mexico. Uh, they, it, it is a very large array of listening devices. And it's a real place. And they actually filmed it there. But it was very difficult because they had to negotiate with the National Science Foundation for what they called dish control. Because they needed the dishes to be turned in a certain direction to catch the light for certain scenes. But it's a working facility, and usually the dishes needed to be pointed in a different place listening out into space. You're going to hear a mention of something called Occam's Razor. Anybody familiar with the term Occam's Razor? It uh, is based on a theory that was uh, presented by William of Occam. He was a 14th century Franciscan priest who basically believed that if you have two explanations for some problem you're trying to solve, most of the time, the one that requires the fewest assumptions or guesses is probably the one that's correct. This movie is in many ways, the story you're going to see is, uh, it, it really illustrates the pros and cons fighting to understand that. OK, I'm going to show you a clip in just a moment. There is an interesting thing that happened. Since they couldn't get Sidney Poitier, uh, at the time that this was made, Bill Clinton was the president. They decided to cast Bill Clinton as the president. And they did it because at the time there had been this, this remarkable scientific discovery, a uh, Mars rock, a meteorite, had been found 12 years before in Antarctica. And a gentleman, uh, a scientist, suggested that he thought that maybe there were living microbes on it that could be the proof of some kind of life in space. And so there was this moment where Bill Clinton was about to get onto his helicopter and he talked about it. And what he had to say was, was very interesting in the world we have today with uh, where science literacy is. Uh, really enjoy a president who talks about science <laughs> as something to be respected. <laughs> but Robert Zemeckis said, there is my scene. And he took this speech and he turned it into the speech in the film. So we wanted to show you what Bill Clinton actually said so that you can see how it's adjusted in the film to be talking not about a Mars rock, but about a different kind of discovery. So let's roll that. And uh, then we'll chat for just a second afterwards. And then uh, get on with the movie. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be joined by my science and technology advisor, Dr. Jack Gibbons, to make a few comments about today's announcement by NASA. This is the product of years of exploration and months of intensive study by some of the world's most distinguished scientists. Like all discoveries, this one will and should continue to be reviewed, examined, and scrutinized. It must be confirmed by other scientists. But clearly, the fact that something of this magnitude is being explored is another vindication of America's space program and our continuing support for it, even in these tough financial times. I am determined that the American space program will put its full intellectual power and technological prowess behind the search for further evidence of life on Mars. First, I have asked Administrator Golden to ensure that this finding is subject to a methodical process of further peer review and validation. Second, I have asked the Vice President to convene at the White House before the end of the year a bipartisan space summit on the future of America's space program. A significant purpose of this summit will be to discuss how America should pursue answers to the scientific questions raised by this finding. Third, 
We are committed to the aggressive plan we have put in place for, ro for robotic exploration of Mars. America's next unmanned mission to Mars is scheduled to lift off from the Kennedy Space Center in November. It will be followed by a second mission in December. I should tell you that the first mission is scheduled to land on Mars on July the 4th, 1997, Independence Day. It is well worth contemplating how we reach this moment of discovery. More than four billion years ago, this piece of rock was formed as a part of the original crust of Mars. After billions of years, it broke from the surface and began a 16 million year journey through space that would end here on Earth. It arrived in a meteor shower 13,000 years ago. And in 1984, an American scientist on an annual U.S. government mission to search for meteors on Antarctica picked it up and took it to be studied. Appropriately, it was the first rock to be picked up that year, rock number 84001. Today, rock 84001 speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. Its implications are as far-reaching and awe-inspiring as can be imagined. Even as it promises answers to some of our oldest questions, it poses still others even more fundamental. We will continue to listen closely to what it has to say as we continue the search for answers and for knowledge that is as old as humanity itself, but essential to our people's future. Thank you. There is uh, one other place in the film where they use a different speech, uh, and uh, they've repurposed it uh, f for those taking notes, what Bill Clinton was actually talking about in the second speech is Saddam Hussein, not voices from space. So after the film, of course, one of the uh, most important parts of this series is we're going to have a post-film conversation. And we've invited Dr. Eugenie Scott here to come and be a part of this. Now, for my column, 22 and a half years ago, we saw this film together and uh, had a great conversation then. Um, she is uh, the former executive director of the National Center for Science Education. She's author of the book Evolution Versus Creationism, an introduction, co-editor of the anthology Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools, and perhaps most important, she appeared in 2004 on an episode of the Showtime television series Pen and Teller Bullshit. <laughs> so uh, I would like you to uh, greet her. She's gonna come up and tell you something to look for. And then we'll have the film. Good evening. Well, I'll keep this short because we all want to see the movie. Um, and I'm not going to be spoiling it for anybody. If I remind you that a good deal of this movie is concerned with science and religion, sometimes science versus religion, but contrasts between science and religion. And there's, there's one scene that's always kind of um, stuck out to, struck out to me. Um, Palmer is talking to Ellie, and uh, they're having this debate about how you know science has to do with evidence and like that, and and uh, religion has to do with faith, and they're sort of arguing about this. And Palmer says, and this is not spoiling anything. Palmer says to her, you know, you say you love your father. That's another big theme in the in the movie. And she says yes, and he says prove it. Watch that and think about it a little bit because maybe we'll come back and talk about what proof is really appropriately applied to and what it perhaps is not. Anyway, we're going to watch a fun movie tonight, aren't we? All right. Here you go. Enjoy contact. Well, thanks for sticking around. Uh, so. Hi there, nice Hi. to see you again. Nice to see you. I think you. I got all the popcorn brushed off my <laughs> dress. Never buy popcorn and wear a black dress. It's really not a good idea. So it's been a long time since I've seen this film. It's, it's still a good film. It's really a good film, yeah. I, 
I haven't seen it since it came out. So, so given Do what y'all like it, yeah. yeah, it's really a good movie. So, I suspect nowadays they have much snazzier special effects, but those weren't very shabby special effects when you come right down to it. So yes, no, especially that opening sequence. It's still yeah. stunning. Yeah, but but I think it's the. It's the content of that opening sequence, which is really cool. You know, the, the radio messages going back further and further in time as you're going further and further out into space. It's just such a nice combination. It really gives a sense of the, the hugeness of space, yeah. which works for right up to the ending of the film. Yep. So given uh, everything that's taken place in, uh, in the world and in the U.S. regards to you know, science literacy and all that. How is watching this film 22 and a half years later different from watching it the first time? Well, certainly, just, you know, just speaking personally, and I don't know how widely this is shared, but I thought how how really great it was to have had a president who was really interested in science <laughs> and, and thinking that this sort of thing would perhaps not go on today. But uh, alas, that's, uh, uh, that, that's maybe a little background radiation for, for this movie. Um, the, the treatment of science and religion in the movie, I think, is is... is thinner than I thought it was the first time through. We, you know, 20 some years ago, um, I thought that the science and religion treatment was, was, was really quite profound, but I, I've learned a few things since then, because you know, since then, uh, my, my professional life, I, I'm, a re, I'm a recovering college professor. I, I, I taught uh, university bi biological anthropology for a dozen years or so, and then I shifted to becoming a nonprofit director. And the nonprofit that I directed for uh, 27 years, but who's counting, uh, is one here in the Bay Area called the National Center for Science Education. And what we did do, my successor continues, is monitor the creationism and evolution controversy and try to keep evolution in the public schools, which means we dealt a great deal with science and religion. And in, uh, and, um, in my last few years at NCSC, we also added climate change because just as evolution is a very well accepted scientific idea, uh, for which some people have an ideological opposition and they make it very difficult for teachers to teach it. Same thing happens with climate change. It's a well-accepted, um, you know, anthropogenic climate change is a well-accepted scientific idea, but there are people who object to it for ideological reasons and make it difficult for teachers to teach. It's a different ideological reason. In the case of evolution, the ideology is religious. In the case of uh, anthropogenic climate change, the ideology is uh, economic and political, but it's still ideology uh, keeping um, solid science from being understood by um, students, but also other members of the public as well. So anyway, background information. Um, I've done a lot more thinking about science and religion since the first time I saw this movie. And I was struck on the second go-round here that it's, it's kind of superficial, both in its treatment of science as well as its treatment of religion. Um, my personal feeling is that the movie doesn't give religion the depth that it should, and it also doesn't really give science the depth that it should. Um, there, there's a certain tendency in the movie to treat science as if it's a, a worldview or a philosophical system. Well, in my opinion, and I'm, I am a humanist, I'm not a, I'm not a theist, science is a really, really, really great way of understanding the natural world. But as an epistemology goes, it's limited. It's really good for explaining the natural world. It's not going to tell you a whole lot of other things. It's not going to tell you whether the Beatles are better than Bieber, right? Um, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of, of this uh, show uh, that I, I was 
calling attention to this one exchange between Palmer and Ellie, where um, Palmer asks her, um, can you prove that you love your father? And she looks kind of startled. Well, that's the wrong question, okay? Though I can't prove to you that the Beatles are better than Bieber. We could have a debate about that. I think most everybody here is closer to my age than the Bieber you know, <laughs> favoring age, but nonetheless. Um, you know, we, 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 could, we could talk about uh, the quality of the music, the quality of the lyrics. We, we could defend our positions in terms of some sort of logical or empirical or rational kinds of arguments. But when, you, you know, when push comes to shove, things like aesthetics are not based upon, are truly not based upon empirical evidence. It's, you could consider it an opinion. It's not an opinion whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth. You can take a position on geocentrism or heliocentrism based upon empirical evidence, logic, and rational kinds of evaluations of evidence. It's not an opinion. But there's a lot of things in the world that are opinions, and religion and philosophy, which are different ways of looking at these other kinds of issues, these non-natural world issues. They can be very useful in helping you make up your mind about them. Anyway, those were the, some of the thoughts that I had. Well, when we saw this, um, when it first came out, and uh, I published an article about it, at that point, you said something that uh, you were kind of just talking about. Um, this, is, this is a quote from uh, Dr. Scott. You know what I think? I think we non-believers need to find a term other than spiritual to describe many of our profound experiences. I wish we could find a word that means awe and wonder and excitement and love without the supernatural twist that spiritual has. That was pretty good. I didn't remember saying that. <laughs> you, you should never quote yourself. That's tacky. But I really like that. And I, I still agree with that. I, you know, I... Some of you may also be not believers, and, and people like, like me are often asked, well, are you a spiritual person? And I have no idea what that means. Um, if it means, do you believe in the supernatural? Sorry, you know, I, I just don't think there are gods or ancestor spirits or you know, things that are not matter and energy. I mean, I'm perfectly happy with matter and energy. I have many Christian theologians who are friends of mine who look at the world very differently. And we still um, are friends, we still admire each other. We, neither of us think the other is somehow mentally deficient for holding the views that we do. And my friends who are theologians are all, you know, thoroughly accepting of the same science that I accept. So I do not see a big divide between science and religion. And some religious views, yeah, are incompatible with many conclusions of science, but religion per se, spirituality, whatever that is, um, is not uh, necessarily incompatible with a scientific view of looking at the natural world because the natural world is what science is really good at explaining. It's not so good at explaining many other things that are important. Well, the thing that seems different for me is I, I expected that 22 years after this film, there would be more acceptance of science, mm -hmm. not less. And yet there seems to be a, a more popular contempt for science that gets expressed. I don't agree. Um, and again, there are data. <laughs> um, the uh, science, and, um, science and Engineering Indicators is a study that's done every two years by the uh, National Research Council. And, um, and there are other, Pew and some of the other survey research people also have done a number of surveys of American attitudes towards science. And even though there is a real popular view uh, um, going about these days that, oh, Americans are anti-scientific, the data don't bear that out. All of the surveys we have show that Americans really like science. They think science is great. Um, they are you know, particularly medical science and technology. They really like the, they like the toys. Uh, grandma got a new hip, she's bowling again. They love medical technology. Um, they also like natural history. 
the number of people who go to zoos and aquaria and um, natural history museums is, is higher than that going to baseball games. Um, when you ask Americans, um, what are your most admired professions? Scientists are right up there next to physicians and uh, policemen. Those are sort of in the top three. You ask Americans, do you want your kids to grow up to be scientists? Yes, that's a great thing for them to do. So it's not that Americans are inherently anti-scientific. The data don't show that. What we do have is a tendency for certain percentages of the population to not like this science or not like that science. I, I would encourage you to be careful generalizing from news about that kind of information, those kinds of attitudes, to a, I think, a non-existent anti-scientific attitude in America. One of the nice things, speaking as a scientist, that um, these surveys show is that they want the government to spend more money on scientific research. <laughs> Good thing. Um, so, you know, it, it's not an anti-science attitude. Evolution takes it on the chin. Um, climate change takes it on the chin. Uh, there's, um, you know, there's a tiny percentage of Americans, really, they're just loud, uh, that are against vaccinations for kids. You know, there's some kind of, and there's an even tinier slice of people who now are promoting flat earthism. So, you know, we, we do have some fringy kinds of views that get the publicity because, you know, Dog bites man isn't a story. Man bites dog is. So the press is going to tend to go for the, uh, the, the splashier and the unusual stories. So you're going to hear a whole lot about anti-science that I don't think the data supports. Well, I am happy to be proved wrong by the empirical fact. <laughs> and, and, and remember, I am considered a pathological optimist as well. <laughs> <laughs> so one other thing about changes since this. there. There is a, a storyline in it where it's very clear that uh, there are some gender biases that she's being faced as a scientist, where she keeps being, being pushed aside and the men take control. Has anything changed for good or bad since this movie in regards to that? I think so. And by the way, the book makes this, this point even more strongly. I mean, poor Ellie just keeps getting pushed to the margins by by various uh, males who trample all over her but it's it's in the it's in the movie certainly as you say um, there are more women going into stem science technology engineering and math stem there are more women going into stem fields than ever before um, it's it certainly is not a stroll in the park there is still um, difficulties in reaching the higher echelons, the, the, the senior professors, the senior people in, uh, in, in industry who are, work in science. But you know, there, there has certainly been a gradual improvement. Um, there, there's no question about that. But we've got to do more for the pipeline, and that's where science education comes in. We're losing too many people in general, male and female, boys and girls, um, who kind of get washed out of the science pipeline and K-12 teaching, K-12 education. The uh, whole Occam's razor thing that shows up in here is interesting. I, I did a little research on William of Occam. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing about him is, though, Occam's razor is used by scientists, but he was a religious person. So his point was the simplest possible view is that God just did it. <laughs> and it's, it, it's just kind of interesting that his <laughs> Occam's razor was sort of from his point of view was created to defend the, the spiritual religious God did it kind of view. I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Um, but it, it, it may, you know, Occam's razor makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the, the more Rube Goldberg-esque Rube Goldberg explanation you have, the less likely it actually is true. And there, there's this wonderful twist at the end, you know, where um, in essence, without saying the word, because she's very careful about that, Ellie is asking them to accept her uh, story on faith because in, you know, even though there's no evidence, but there's evidence, right? 
those 18 hours of static. Um, that is evidence. It's just that the bad guys are kind of shoving that under the rug. Um, things would be very, very different if that evidence were able to be exposed. So she's not... I always, I always told my students, and when I, was, when I would talk about science in a, in a public lecture, that the one thing a scientist says more frequently than anything else is, I don't know yet. And that yet is a really important adverb. There's a, it's, not, it's not added nearly frequently enough, in my opinion. Um, there are a lot of things that we don't know. If we stop there, we communicate the idea that we never will know. If you say we don't know yet, that leaves open the po that that leaves in the person's mind who's listening to you the possibility that there is a solution. There will be a way at some point to know. Now, I like to think that that's true about most of the natural world. This this matter and energy world that that is the 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 goal of understanding of which is the goal of science. But, you know, I, I sometimes think that, that we, we might be the goldfish of the universe. And by that I mean, I have a goldfish. And as goldfish goes, this goldfish is brilliant. This is the Einstein of goldfish. Because when I walk up to the goldfish bowl, the goldfish swims to the top of the water. When my husband comes up to the goldfish bowl, big deal. I'm the one who feeds, feeds the goldfish, right? Now, the brilliant goldfish is sitting on the counter in my kitchen. And because we live in California, at some point there is this rumbling in the earth and the water sloshes out of the goldfish bowl. Now, no matter how brilliant that goldfish that goldfish is never going to understand that three miles below the surface of the earth, two plates crunched against each other and caused a series of waves to come to the surface, causing the earthquake that caused the water to slosh out of the bowl. There may be some aspects of the natural world for which we are goldfish. Our brains just aren't wired enough to actually understand them. But we don't know <laughs> They're unknown unknowns. <laughs> Don't mean to bring politics into this, but but for the time being, let's just let's just assume that we don't know yet. You know, theoretically, there may be things that we cannot know. But I'm not. But if if we're talking about understanding the natural world, if we're talking about understanding what caused those plates to go together and uh, how to measure the frequency of those waves and how much shaking of the goldfish bowl water is going to come out, if we're talking about aspects of matter and energy, we've got pretty darn good brains. Let's just try to understand as much as we can, and you know, as civilization continues, we'll develop better methods for understanding the natural world. We may be goldfish, but let's not, let's be pathological optimists. <laughs> well, I think that's a good place to end. It's been a, a long evening, a little longer than expected. So um, thank you so much for coming. Thank in you all for coming. Chatting. This was a fun night, wasn't it? Thank you for the film series. And uh, we hope uh, some of you will come back in a month to see the movie Her. <laughs>